Are you all in yet on the, our future of self-driving cars? What if I would tell you that you don't need to have any more teenagers going through the front windshield? I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green. This episode of Right Angle is brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. Gentlemen, there's an a op-ed piece written by a neurosurgeon um, in the Washington Post, I believe, uh, Dr. Jonathan Slotkin. And he is one of those guys who has to see the teenagers who've been through the windshield. And recently, Waymo, the self-driving car company, um, basically shared all their data uh, with the world, I think, but he had access to seeing all their data, autonomous vehicles, and what the accident rates are for autonomous vehicles, and especially the the crippling and deadly accident rates are compared to non-autonomous vehicles. And a lot of the stories, Stephen Green, that we're seeing in the media are the, the hazards, the dangers of autonomous vehicles. And anytime one has a crash or catches fire or you know runs into something, they, th that gets played up. Um, Waymo apparently did not filter this data, just, sh just shared it out oh, good with everyone. With everybody, yeah, and or, or at least with the people for whom the data would make sense to to see, and uh, they they created a graph of crashes per million miles, and then categorized it by serious injury or worse, meaning death, um, airbag deployments, um, or any injury whatsoever. And what you see, especially like in the serious injury category, um, crashes per million miles that resulted in serious injury. These are these are small numbers, which I'm glad to hear. But when you multiply them by millions of miles, yeah. it gets bigger. But Steve, serious injury, uh, a human driver is about 0.23 crashes per million miles that result in serious injury or death. Uh, with a Waymo vehicle or any self-driving car that has something similar to this, instead of 0.23, it's 0 0.02. Wow. Um, a significant... That's a, that's a, if I'm doing the math right in my head, that's, that's an order of magnitude better. That's a tenth. Yeah. And this similar numbers, if you look at uh, airbag deployments and, and uh, any injury whatsoever. In fact, it's much more impressive with any injury. Um, it goes from 3.96 with human drivers down to 0.8 um, with, with the Waymo car. And what they found is when they study some of the accidents that Waymo vehicles have been in, in general, it's not the self-driving car's fault. <laughs> they're getting T-boned at intersections. They're, you know, there are some situations where the self-driving car had a glitch, did something wrong or whatever. But a lot of these situations are because of human drivers involved and, and, and caused this accident. Um, I got to tell you, Steve, I am... You know, I love driving my own car. I can't imagine being reliant upon, let's say, public transit. Um, I have, I've only been in an Uber on the occasions when my car broke down <laughs> and I had to have uh, one of those kind of services. On the other hand, when you hear the idea that maybe somebody's not going to a roadside memorial and putting flowers on a little cross next to a tree, where their teenager died five years ago. Um, it, it makes some sense that we might want to move. Now, this doctor is not saying, hey, we have to, we have, to have only self-driving cars, but he was basically saying, if you would increase the percentage of self-driving self cars to maybe 30% of those cars on the road or something like that, that the, the lives saved and the injuries prevented would be massive. And the money saved, literally trillions of dollars in expenses and healthcare and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you think the arc, the public health argument can be made and would induce more people to go the self-driving way as they become more affordable to do so? Yeah, induce is the key word there, because whenever I hear a public health argument, it's almost always in service of a government mandate or uh, to do something or a, a, a government forbidding you. From well, let me ask something. you, do you have any handguns in your house is what the doctor will want to know. Yeah. Several. Yeah. And that's as close to an answer as I'm going to give you on that one. Um, so, yeah, the, the public health argument from the government standpoint is is one that I recoil from. And I, on a personal level, I recoil from owning a self-driving car, at least so far. Because like you, Scott, I enjoy the art of driving. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy precision. Yeah. There is, there, there's, that's the there, word. 
there, yeah, there's, there is something about coming through, say, a, a left-hand turn onto a new street where you decelerate just the right amount without having to hit the brake. You accelerate perfectly through the turns, the, the gear shift. Nobody has a manual anymore, not even yeah. me who misses mine. You, you accelerate so perfectly that the gear shift feels invisible. And when you are done with your turn, you are perfectly in the new lane, and you never crossed a line that you, you should have crossed. Uh, and, and that just, just, that simple act brings joy to me in doing that. That said, based on the, the, just the statistics, and it's really hard to argue with the raw data, um, the machine's going to do that better than me. Uh, and and that, that breaks my heart a little. Uh, I know someday I'm either just going to get too old to do this myself and I'll get a self-driving car or uh, I'll just want one because they're cool. That's how I make most of my buying decisions. Oh, that's cool. I want one. No, yeah. three. Um, but there's another point, And, Scott, this, this really hooked me on, on your opening. You were talking about driving and teenagers, and I'm the father of, of two teenagers, so I thought what you were going to say was something funny about teenage drivers, and instead you went with teenagers flying through the windshield. And I've got a 19-year-old son who costs an astronomical amount to insure, and I have a 15-and-a-half-year-old son who is about to become, in about six months, hmm. astronomical to insure. And I love the fact that my older son is a good driver. Uh, we, we trust him driving the younger son around. Um, but boy, if they could have that to lean on, um, not only might I save thousands of dollars uh, a year, thousands and thousands of dollars a year, I might even sleep a little better. Uh, and uh, some of this future is not for me just because I'm older and a little old fashioned, but. Um, the future that my my kids are are maturing into is uh, it's kind of amazing. I want to see them live long enough to really enjoy it. Now, Bill Whittle, what this Dr. Slotkin is calling for really isn't any kind of mandates from the government. However, he does think we need to gather data differently. He says, um, and, and this is going to require, in his view, federal leadership. He said current regulations require companies to report crashes but not miles driven or where those miles occurred. He said, we need the denominator, not just the numerator. Yeah. So Waymo is giving crash data with miles driven you know, together. Um, and he's saying basically they should beef up data reporting requirements to include crash rates, miles driven and where, safety performance, and then have independent auditors verify this data against police reports, insurance claims, and, and the like. Um, and he thinks that'll go a long way to encouraging the industry to and people, honestly, to get on board with this. But Bill, my guess is that uh, that you don't think that any uh, garbage scow of an automobile can drive better than you can. That you think that you can outperform, outmaneuver, and and behave in a safer manner than something that has lidar instant response and a 360 degree spherical all the time view of everything well first of all self-driving cars are straight up communism let's just get that out. <laughs> <laughs> next thing you know you'll be playing soccer yeah exactly and using the metric system oh now you've gone too far <laughs> so the Let's start with the obvious. There's certainly uh, people out there, and not just young young people. I mean, there are people in their 20s now, or certainly in their teens, who are going to be on that dividing line. And the dividing line is people older than them are never going to feel comfortable in a self-driving car, and people younger than them are never going to feel comfortable in a human-driven car. Hmm. And, and that's just the way it is. My feeling about this is uh, is old-fashioned, but that doesn't mean it's not... It's not true. I think that there's something here that reminds me a little bit of the gun control argument. When you talk about saving kids going through windshields, it's the same thing as, you know, if you ban guns or got rid of guns, if you just magically make them disappear, you know, then then um, you wouldn't have as many murders and, and all of that. But what, what you don't see is the part of the iceberg that's beneath the water. And with the, with the handgun issue, 
it's not just a question of, of freedom of speech and, and preventing government, um, you know, overreach at South Carolina, all of the arguments that we all understand for the Second Amendment. When I first got my first firearm, I was relatively late in life, it changed the way I felt about myself. It changed about my, it, it changed my sense of agency. It, it, it made me feel as if I am not dependent on an external source if somebody comes kicking through my door or coming through my window. I, I, it really magnified my sense of confidence and I feel somewhat the same way about the self-driving car argument. Um, there's no question that they're going to be safer. I don't think I don't. It, these are first-generation self-driving yeah. cars, and as you say, they are in a population of human-driven cars, and so probably most, if not very high number of those accidents are created by humans driving cars that are hitting self-driving cars. But again, what's what's underneath the surface of the water? There is a. As Steve pointed out, there's a there's a visceral, uh, sensational thrill to being able to, to drive a car well. It's a it's a it's a tactile uh, experience, and it's, it gives you a sense of confidence in the same way that uh, uh, a firearm uh, possession does. It, it it is an indicator of your competence. It's it's good to be it's good to be a good driver. It feels good, and and, and it's something to take take pride in. But but here's where I really live on this issue. Um, I suppose that. Um, that self-driving cars are something that you could buy for yourself. And I have no doubt that that's going to be the case for, for some people, but it feels like the self-driving car thing is probably going to turn into something more like an Uber where the car will just appear at your residence when you need it and you get in it and you hop out and so on. And this is the thing that I have the problem with because what people uh, who are uh, considerably young, not even that much younger than, than, than we are, they don't, they, I don't want them to never experience what it's like when you own your first car, because it's not a question of being able to go where you want to, when you want to. It is your first private property that you own. It is your castle. You can go out on a date. You can park the car. You can you can be with friends. You can go on road trips. It is, it is the first time in your life as a young adult where you have control of the environment. You're not living at your parents' house. You're, you're in Autonomy. your car. Yeah. And I've never seen uh, anybody my age buy a, a, a three or four hundred dollar junker for a first car and not have the very first thing they do is go out and clean and wax it, um, and, <laughs> and 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 dream about repainting it and 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 say, well, if I could fix up maybe the seats. And it, it's easy for for younger people to scoff at this and okay, boomer kind of okay, boomer yeah, the thing yeah. under the carpet, but they're they only do that because they don't know what they're missing. They don't know what that sense of that sense of pride and that sense of, of agency and independence that comes with the ability to be where you want to be when you want to be there and not be at the mercy of anybody else's schedule. And I think that would be a great detriment to society to lose that. So um, I think that a self-driving car drives much better than the majority of the drivers on the road. It's possible that it drives better than I am, than I do, but I, I doubt it. <laughs> There, there, there are. Look, there are times when I what will be will be the perfect solution for me, would be for me to be able to keep a sports car, drive the sports car, but on those occasions where I'm so tired that I hope the car in front of me is going to my driveway because I'm just going to follow those red lights. It would be nice to be able to turn that on. That to me would be the best of both yeah. worlds. And let me let me throw something in uh, that I didn't make clear at first. One is uh, no mandates. You can't mandate these things. No damn mandates. The other is. If I ever do buy a self-driving car, the damn thing is still going to have a steering wheel. Yeah, because I will never feel I will never feel comfortable in a car hmm. where I'm in the front and I don't have something to control that thing. Yeah. Parenthetically, I know we're running along in this episode, but parenthetically, did you see that uh, during uh, was during some of the uh, you know uprisings not too long ago, where a guy was in L.A. or I think it was L.A. or L.A. or San Francisco was in a Waymo, got surrounded by the by a mob of people. And the people were spray painting the car, and and the car is not going to drive over people. It just simply can't. And you're just a you're just a, a, a fish in a can in, in in that particular case. And you know you better hope that the people who are smashing your windows are are, are are nice guys. Yeah, you can't kick it into beast mode and have it <laughs> barge. <laughs> <in the ground. laughs> You know, I do I do picture Bill having a car that has self-driving capabilities and then every once in a while Bill just will just sing out Jarvis take the wheel. Um, <laughs> and I that would be handy like well, I I would like the ability 
to to say something or or press some button or whatever when I'm in a, a situation that I can't extricate myself from. Yeah, but of course, the problem with that is my confidence would lead me to believe that I can extricate myself from it. <laughs> um, you know, there. This is a little bit down the road, obviously. I mean, currently, uh, according to Dr. Slotkin in this op-ed, um, it's about $100,000 just to make a car self-driving. And, uh, and as Bill pointed out, we're still in the first generation of this. Um, they also have concerns, believe it or not, that the early adopters of self-driving cars, either with a, a ride service, kind of uh, as you talked about, um, or personal ownership of them, the early adopters will be people who were on public transit. And the last thing in the world we want to do is take dollars out of the coin box on the bus or the, the subway. They don't want to reduce the revenue for public transit because you know how we desperately need that so much so that government has to step in in every city where it's ever been tried and, and prop it up because it's that popular. Um, so, you know, there are there are issues with that. But here's, the, here's where I think Dr. Slotkin goes amiss. Um, and that is, he's basically thinking if we, instead of making a technology case for these things, we should make a public health case. I don't think a public health case resonates. I think what resonates is I don't want my kid being crushed in a car. I don't want grandpa losing his life after, you know, 80 years of joyful existence and, and yeah. beloved by the family. And it's because a, a bad mix of medications or reaction times are not what they used to be or whatever. It's, it's, it's my boy. It's my pop. It's, you know, it's my wife. It's not public health. And uh, liberal voters tend to respond to large scale, you know, demographical kinds of statements. Conservatives are more concerned with people, persons, individuals. And if you're going to make the case, I think, I think that's where it needs to be made. It reminded me of um, an incident that happened some years ago, and I'm about to reveal just massive stupidity on my part, um, but it's been no secret for all these years. Um, I was uh, on the sidewalk in a little town where I lived, and I was holding one of my children on my arm when this, uh, this car that had been souped up by its uh, young owner, uh, making a lot of noise, comes barreling down this one-lane street that has cars parked on both sides of it. It's a residential neighborhood. And, and it's, the speed limit there is like 15 miles an hour, and he just punched it at the end of the street, and he's coming down the street much faster. <laughs> then is safe to navigate on that street. And I happened to be standing in between two cars at the time. And he was slowing down a little bit because the stop sign was coming up. But as he went past me, I slapped the rear fender of his car with my open palm. And he, he stood on the brakes. And then he squealed and backed up and, and started, brought, took his window down and started to yell at me like, hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? And I looked at him and I said, son, what I'm doing is I'm saving you from having to wake up every day for the rest of your life out of a bad dream as you watch the head of a small child roll across your windshield and realize that if you had just slowed down a little bit, you wouldn't be in this awful place. And he goes, yes, sir. And slowly drove away. Um, that kid loved his car, obviously, put a lot of... That, that kind of independent spirit into it. Um, on the other hand, I don't want that kid waking up in, in jail for manslaughter because of something stupid he did. I don't want any of my kids being extricated with the jaws of life from a vehicle that got crushed because of something stupid they did or somebody else did. Um, it is really appealing to me to, to drastically increase the safety of motor vehicle transportation. That said, as Steve reiterated, you can't, you can't force people to do it. But I think if you make the case in a personal way and not in a public or legislative way, you make a lot more headway. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.